In Solomon chapter 1, the ancient legacy of philosophy, the author casts the discipline as an ongoing conversation, and he invites you to join us in it. He says on page 6, quote, By this point, you should not just be reading. You should be thinking, trying to answer these questions for yourself, and maybe even jotting down some of your own thoughts. I invite you to do the same. Don't just let these questions and these arguments in this class wash over you. Don't be a passive listener or observer. Instead, spend some time trying to figure this stuff out for yourself. It'll have a huge impact, I believe, on the rest of your life, and I think you'll be very rewarded if you do invest a little bit of time in this. Solomon, of course, covers the different religious and philosophical traditions throughout the history, and he talks about, of course, Socrates, who we might consider the great, 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 great grandfather of everything we're doing. He talks about, of course, Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity and even Confucius from China. I want to zero in on just a couple of things, though. And the first is, in Buddhism, I assume, of course, that since this class is being taught in East Tennessee, you already know a great deal about Christianity. But one thing that you may be able to use in your personal life that we can all take from Buddhism is that the Buddha argued that the center and the source of all suffering is desire. If you can let go of your desire for, your, for a thing, your suffering will disappear. For example, if you're very desirous of, say, a new Porsche, and the fact that you can't afford a new Porsche, well, perhaps you can. I can't afford a new Porsche. But the fact that I can't afford a new Porsche, if I were to fixate on it and want that Porsche and watch YouTube videos of that Porsche and daydream about that Porsche all day, that would lead to a great deal of frustration and suffering. But if I could let go of that desire for the Porsche, the suffering would disappear. And so the source of that suffering is the desire. The same is true when you prick your finger or you smash your hand in a window or with a hammer on accident. I've done that several times. If you fixate on the pain, the pain worsens. If you think, I wish my finger didn't hurt so bad, I wish my hand wasn't smashed, it gets worse. But if you can pause, and if you can let go of that desire to not experience the pain, the pain becomes more of just a sensation, something that you can observe, but something that you don't necessarily have to participate in the agony of. Now, I'm sure there are certain pains in this world, and certain ongoing pains in particular, that a person could not ignore, or you'd have to be a very well-practiced Buddhist or someone who's just very good at this to just let those desires for those pains to stop go. But I challenge you to give that a try. If there's something in your life that's really frustrating you, think about letting go, the, letting go of the desire for it or either to have it or get rid of it or whatever. Just try to let go of that desire. See if that what that does for you. That's one thing I want to zero in on. And the other is what Solomon has to say about faith. And I want to read a passage here, and then I'm going to invite you to reflect on this. He says, quote, having faith does not mean being dogmatic, refusing to ask questions or accept any evidence that contradicts one's already accepted beliefs. The idea of thinking for oneself has now become part and parcel of our conception of maturity, and it is especially essential in contemporary democracy. And that's from page 13. And so I want you to think about what it means to have faith. And if having faith is consistent with questioning, if having faith means I can't entertain anything that runs contrary to my current views, to what my current understanding of my religious belief is, perhaps. Is that what faith means? Or does faith permit a person to challenge their views? Does faith encourage a person to challenge their views, to examine them, to perhaps refine them, to make them better, to accept views that make the most sense to them? Or to be a faithful person in whatever way you understand that conception, does that require that you remain and I don't want to use the word closed-minded because that has very negative connotations, but essentially, if you were unwilling to even entertain things that were contrary to what you currently believe, I suppose that would be an accurate description. So that's the discussion question for chapter one. You can perhaps think a bit about Buddhism and if it would be possible to let go of a particular desire, depending on how terrible it is. And you might experiment with that yourself and then perhaps write about it a bit. But then also... Does faith require that you never challenge your current beliefs, or can faith make room for that? Would faith encourage that? Is that a good or a bad thing from that perspective? Thanks for your attention.